Our scripture reading today is Exodus 3. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them out, up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign that you, to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you will say to the Israelites. I am has sent you, has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. Go, assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob appeared to me and said, I have watched over you. And have seen what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised to bring you out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. A land flowing with milk and honey. The elders of Israel will listen to you. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord, our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. And after that, he will let you go. And I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed towards these pe- this people, so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman is to ask her neighbor and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters. And so you will plunder the Egyptians. This is the word of the Lord. God bless you, Roy. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come into your presence, we do so with a great sense of awe and wonder, for you are the God who continues to amaze us. You have reached out to us. You have given us the story from eternity to eternity. And now you give us the opportunity to be stretched 
and to realize once again who you are and what you call us to do. Guide us and direct us in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple things before we dig into the passage of scripture for today. First of all, I, I want to share with you a little bit of my story because it has to do with this passage of scripture in one way or another. And, and after that, when we start to move through the passage itself, be aware of this. I'm not gonna read the whole 22 verses over again, but as we go through the passage, you'll see some passages that are bold and italicized, and those are the pieces that have just struck out to me and come to me so that we can focus upon them. But let me tell you a little bit about my story. First of all, uh, it's taken me some time, but when I was a boy of about eight years old, uh, in my home church in West Orange, New Jersey, we had what was called Christian Service Brigade, and the young boys were stockaders and the older, one, older ones were brigaders. So when we were old enough, I started in stockaders and I really enjoyed it and poured myself into it. Every week we had different uh, opportunities to go and get different uh, awards, and I got about every one that you could possibly get. But part of those weekly achievements included scripture memorizing. So as a boy of eight years old, I started getting up at 6.30 instead of seven o'clock before school, and I started memorizing scripture, and I loved it. And I'm so glad that I did, because now it comes back to me in, in marvelous kinds of ways. Well, moving on along, when I was 14 years of age, we got a new pastor. Alan Christensen was his name. He was a wonderful man, and he really had a heart's passion for young people. And I still remember full well that that particular summer, when I was about 14, that on the front lawn of the church, they put a big tent for vacation Bible school. And we put the youth into that tent. I still remember myself sitting in the back row of that tent on a folded chair, and we had, for, for that entire week, we had uh, lessons going through 2 Timothy. And I remember extremely well uh, what happened. Johnny Van Lett was the man who taught it. He was part of a, a group called, um, you know, it, it, was, it was a high school born againers group. And he, and he got to that, that fourth chapter and he got to that, uh, those first couple of verses there. And I still remember sitting in the back seat and the verse that came up was, the words that came up were simple. I charge you, preach the word. I'm sitting in the back row and I say to myself, that's for me. The Lord is talking to me. And that was the very moment when I felt the clearest spiritual event of my life, then and now, that the Lord was calling me into ministry. There was no question about it. Well, that has stayed with me now, I have to tell you, there's been many a time when I have questioned whether I really misheard that. When I've gone through some difficult times in churches and with, believe it or not, people, uh, I've said, now, Lord, maybe I didn't hear you correctly. And if so, just let me know, because I'm sure that I can find something which pays better and is not nearly as stressful. <laughs> the Lord never rescinded his call. And by his grace, I was grateful for all of that experience. Now, let me give you uh, another example from my home days when I was still at home. And between my junior and senior year at Franklin and Marshall, I got a job. It was through a, a person who was very active in our church. He was the, at that point, vice president of a major construction company. And so I got a job as a laborer. Now, the, this was uh, a labor working, and the position was uh, for a $60 million addition to Anheuser Bush. Now, even though it was for Anheuser Bush, I can assure you that I never imbibed. <laughs> but what I do remember is this I got a ride with a, a fellow who was a school teacher and wasn't working during the summer, so we got a ride together. And if you know anything about North Jersey, um, it beats even the most busy of times on the Liddes Pike by, you know, like you would not believe. And so in order to find a, a better way to get to work in the morning, 
Uh, he knew about different ins and outs and, and ways that we could go. And so we had this little uh, trip that we would make every morning and we would go past this particular Jewish synagogue. And on the front yard of that synagogue, there was a statue. And the statue that we saw every day had a, an inscription on it. And it was that inscription that says, and the bush was not consumed. And you know, and I know what that bush was all about. You know that story and you know how much it impressed me. Now, I still remember that. I can see it vividly in my mind. But now we want to go to unpack the story, the complete story of that time together. So as we go through this uh, text, remember, you'll see some uh, words that are brought together and they are just highlighted. And we're gonna walk our way through in that way. So let's go on and see. First of all, we come to that first time when uh, we see that uh, Moses was there taking care of his flock and he looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Now that's an amazing thing. Uh, we can't quite imagine that, uh, that there's this bush, it's supposed to burn and quickly go down to nothing. So that was his experience that he saw something which was quite out of the ordinary. Now, let me interrupt for a minute and give you something on a personal note. Brothers and sisters, there have been times when I haven't looked at a burning bush, but sometimes I felt like I was in the burning bush, hoping that the fire would stop. Now, that's by way of saying there are times in ministry when it's tough, it's hard, and things that we would not want to see occur within us or because of us never happen. Ministry isn't easy, but the good news for me has always been that it is in the midst of such times that I have the assurance and the confidence, and I always will, that the Lord has always seen me through, and he will always do so. God is a good God, and we continue to give thanks to him. Well, moving right along, I'm reminded of another story from the scripture. You've heard it. You all know it. The story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know how they were staying loyal to the Lord, and consequently they were thrown into that fiery furnace. And as they had expected, as the people expected that they would have been consumed, they look in there and they see not three people, but a fourth person. And they were reminded of that reality, that the Lord was able to see those three children of Israel safely through that most difficult period when they should have been consumed. The Lord can see us through, even in the midst of the worst fire and danger that we could ever expect. Let's get back to Moses. We see here that the next thing that happens as this bush is under consumption and, it, and it's just holding up there, that the Lord speaks out and says, Moses, Moses. Now that is quite an amazing thing. You know, because hearing that voice reminds us of the reality. It's amazing because you see, the Lord knows Moses by name, fully and completely by name. But I also want to remind you, he knows us by name as well, every one of us. He sees us, he knows us, and he's anxious to do a powerful work within us as well. Now, uh, one thing that explains this a little bit better was one of the devotionals that I read uh, during the time about a month and a half ago or so when Hunter asked if I would be able to preach, and the time that I knew what I was to preach about, uh, there's been some times in my devotional reading that I've, I've been able to see some things. Listen to this. God's first wrote words to Moses called him by name. This shows that even though Moses was now an obscure, forgotten shepherd on the backside of the desert, God knew who he was, and Moses was important to God. The double call, Moses, Moses, implied importance and urgency. The Lord had plenty to do with Moses and through him. Now, in response to this, Moses responds and says, here I am. Now, just pause for a moment. 
I've told you about my story and how I was called into ministry. You see how Moses was called into this phenomenal ministry. But I wonder, when God speaks to us, will we hear? Could it be that the Lord is calling some here, or many who are here in this room at this time, for something to do that we have perhaps put aside or disregarded? Could it be that he is calling you? And if he is, if you hear that nudge, if you hear that still small voice, if you hear that voice of clarity talking to you, then the question becomes, how will you respond? An old gospel song says, I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. How about us? And so we go on with the story. We see that the Lord speaks and says, come no closer, remember the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Uh, I have to tell you this. I was thinking about how I should dress today. And, you know, as you've seen, one of the things that's nice about being in retirement is you can dress as casually as you want. But I thought to myself, maybe what I should do is to get out my white clerical robe that goes down to the floor and wear my Birkenstocks. <laughs> because you see, then I would be able to, to do exactly what the Lord told uh, Moses and I could just kick my Birkenstocks off. Now, but listen, uh, when was the last time you took off your shoes or fell on your knees or, or shouted for joy because God was so near to you? He's a God who is present. He's a God who wants to continue and perfect his work in us. Again, the story continues. And, and as this word is sounded, Moses is quite a bit taken back. And he hides his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Clearly, this was an extraordinary experience. Now, think of this. The burning bush, a voice from God, and he hides his face. Here's the reality that I've learned in life along the way. When things like this occur to us, you can run, but you cannot hide. If Lord wants to break through, he's going to break through. So get with the program. Now, let's listen a little bit more about this whole thing. The Lord says, I have observed the mis misery of my people. Indeed, I know their suffering, and I have come down to deliver them. Now, here's this shepherd, this runaway from Egypt, and here he is, and the Lord reaches out to him. And he tells him that he is clearly aware of what's going on with the people of Israel, the children of Israel. And he speaks to them and says, I've seen what's going on. I know their sufferings, and I have come to deliver them. You know, you think this story is about Moses? No. The story is all about the Lord. And this is what we need to understand and affirm for ourselves. Uh, many of you may aware, be aware of the fact that I did write a book back in, it was published in 2013, and it was telling about my experiences in prison ministry over the years. And the first chapter of that book is simply titled, God is God and you are not. It is the foremost reality that we all have to come to grips with. It's essential and we need to learn. Well, now, listen to this dialogue as it continues. Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and, and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And the Lord simply says, I will be with you. Now, let, let me unpack this a little bit more for you. Moses struggles with his own inadequacy. Who am I? Who am I? How can I possibly do something of, of this magnitude? And I wonder to myself again, how many of us have also question our capability to, to follow God's calling, to do what he wants us to do, and to, to reach out beyond ourselves and seek to accomplish great and wonderful things. The Lord simply impresses Moses, and he impresses us as well, with the most important lesson. God is able. 
We serve a mighty God, and as he speaks, we need to respond in obedience and look forward to what he can do in us and through us. That powerful verse that comes from the book of Romans comes back to me many times. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can stand against us? God wants to do that powerful work in us. It's all about God. Now, Moses digs a little deeper. In, in the Bible from which I uh, have, was looking, the, the little notice put, the divine name is revealed. And Moses says to God, if I come to the Israelites and they ask me, what is your name? What shall I say to them? Interesting. Uh, during the time that I was preparing for this sermon, which was, I, I think it was about six weeks ago that son, or so that son, Hunter had asked if I would preach. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's amazing to me how there is what I call the synchronicity of the spirit. How when you're working on something, when you're trying to wrestle with a particular issue, sometimes the Lord brings awarenesses to us that really help us to get right on target. Well, here's the interesting part in this part that was in our daily bread oh, a month ago or so, something like that. But the important thing that was there was how uh, Tim Gustafson mentioned the, pro mentioned the issue. When God showed up with marching orders, Moses played the I'm not good enough card. He even got into a lengthy argument with God, asking him, who am I? Then God told Moses who he was. I am who I am. That is the lesson he gives. And so the question that uh, is raised in that by Tom, uh, Tim Gustafson is this. The question isn't who I am. The question is, who is the I am? If that could be branded into our minds, it would be powerful for us. Well, it continues. And so this issue comes as the Lord replies, that, that simple picture on the board, that be still and know that I am. But then you see, God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, I am has sent you to me. And as we go down then, we can see even further that part of what this is all about then is living, leading to us to see that this I am is not simply the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Joseph, but it's also the God of, of Jesus. It is he himself who is the great I am. And in Mark chapter 14, it mentions this. The high priest asked him, uh, are you the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the son of the, of the blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And so this is that important reality. God also said to Moses, thus you will say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. It's all, all about God. Now, I came across another insight during that time when I, I you know, what I do is a very simple um, routine in the morning. I get up, usually much earlier than I'd like to, and I get up and I go wash this, the sleepers out of my eyes and then I go and get the coffee going. And when that's on its way, then I can go and begin to do my devotional time. And it's nice being retired because there's no rush for me. I can do it slow and easy and just take the time that I need. And another one of these uh, insights came again with this Exodus chapter three reality. One implication of the magnificent name, I am who I am, is that this infinite, absolute, self-determining God has drawn near to us in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, we who are born of God have the unspeakable privilege of knowing Yahweh as our Father. I am who I am, the God who exists, whose personality and power is owing solely to himself, who never changes, from whom all power and energy in the universe flows, and to whom all creation should confirm, conform to li its life. May those who know the name of Jesus put their trust in him. Well, this is how it all begins to play out. 
And next we come to see that this promise is made. And the Lord, again, confirms very clearly that he uh, is the one who will bring uh, the Israelites out of their misery, out of their captivity, and bring them to a land that is flowing with milk and honey. And so that happens quickly. A land that is flowing with milk and honey. There. And, and that whole verse, especially where it says, I will bring you out of your misery. God's going to do it. You know, people look about Moses, but it's the Lord who has promised that he, he's going to do it. And he gives us that promise over and over again. As we, we come to, to the, closer to the end of the chapter, we see again more of this. And the Lord makes this promise, makes it sure and certain. They will listen to your voice. They'll listen to the voice of Moses because it's not simply the voice of Moses. It is the Lord speaking his words. That's what he promises to do. Uh, again, I think of the New Testament when Jesus begins his public ministry and, and he's in that marriage feast at Canaan of Galilee and, and Mary, Mother Mary tells him as the wine works uh, is, is gone, do whatever he tells you. I wish that could be a motto branded in our hearts and minds that as God speaks, we allow that to be the time that we listen and whatever he tells us, we respond and do. Well, Basically, that takes us through the chapter. But I, I want to just reiterate and speak about these basic truths which have been imprinted upon me as I have looked at this chapter and thought over and over again about it. Lesson number one. The lesson I have learned and affirmed is clear. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's all about God. I am. He will guide and he will provide. It's all about God. And if we could just back off and let God be God, it would have a great difference. Lesson number two, it's a something that I've had along the way. And during difficult times, it's been something of encouragement to me. When I was in my third church, uh, which was in Franklin, Pennsylvania, that was a, a very uh, prestigious, and large congregation at one time. And it was quite a wealthy congregation as well. And the chairman of the search committee that brought me there, I thought things were going very, very well. We came to have a board meeting and I was, we were seated in the fellowship hall around a table. And at the very end of the meeting, which had gone quite well, uh, one of the members of the board said, I have a letter to read to you. And he opened it up and read a letter that the chairman of the search committee, who I thought was very close to me and I thought that we had a great relationship, is leaving the church. And the reason that he was leaving was because I affirmed the position of women in ministry and, and he thought that, that was exactly horrible. Well, the men took off and the women who were gathered around that table I, I just put my head on the table and I started to weep and I, I was just overwhelmed with, with what was set, being said about this. I didn't know what in the world had happened. I, I was just be, uh, distraught as could be. Finally, uh, as I'm laying there with my head on my shoulder, on my arms, um, the women gathered around me were praying. And finally, when I had enough uh, of, of just calmness about me to speak, the words that came to my mouth were very simple. The Lord knew it's going to be okay. Because regardless of what circumstance happened to be, I had the assurance that it was all about God and he'd see me through. Another story. I was very pleased to uh, get to know a, a man who was in our church in Williamsport. Uh, he had had a history of addiction with alcohol and drugs, but the Lord had been doing a great work in his life. A and we continued to, to be close together. I'd encouraged him, and he went from being uh, one who was really quite uh, difficult um, in terms of his lifestyle to one who became a certified lay pastor 
and he had the opportunity to serve different churches along the way. We have continued to be close friends, but what I would use as my motto to him to remind him of the struggles along the way was a simple slogan. Be amazed, keep your eyes on the prize, and don't compromise. As God directs, as he leads, keep on keeping on, and all will be well. Uh, one more story, because it, it speaks of how struggling, how we can struggle along the way, but the Lord can see us through. Uh, when I, we were in different situations that were somewhat difficult, uh, and I didn't know what was going to happen, uh, what I needed to learn along the way was, again, that it wasn't about me, it wasn't about anyone that I knew, but it was all about the Lord himself. And so the little slogan that I came to use was one that I had seen on a road sign. Growing up in West Orange, New Jersey, where we lived and on our way to church, we'd go down a hill and around a curve. And I remember seeing the sign that was posted, be patient, watch progress, enjoy the completed project. And I thought to myself, that speaks to me. Because there are times when it seems as though it's hard. Why doesn't it happen quicker? Why don't I see more progress and, and more exciting things occur along the way? And at each of those times, I think of that motto and re realize that the critical reality for all of us, as it was for Moses, is real simple. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's all about God. Amen.